Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 328, recorded November 23rd, 2011. Your questions, Steve's answers, number 131. Security Now is brought to you by Ford, featuring available Sync with My Ford Touch. Sync with My Ford Touch gets you to your destination with integrated turn-by-turn -turn directions and directional arrows displayed right behind the wheel on screen. Check it out on the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Security Now, the show that uh, talks about security online, privacy online, and a few other side issues like vitamin D, <laughs> uh, e-readers, and science fiction. And that's all because our guy, Steve Gibson, the man, the myth, the legend, besides being a security expert, is a man of the world and has many interests. Uh, a good Cabernet, we should include. We've, we've yet to do a show on Cabernet, however. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll let John handle that. <laughs> hey, Steve, Dvorak. how are you? God, yeah, Dvorak is the, the wine whiz. We're sneaking this in under the wire of the Thanksgiving holiday. L Elaine, in fact, shot me a note since she does our transcription saying, uh, it might be a day later than usual for the transcriptions. I said, well, yeah, of course, you know, you need turkey along with the rest of your oh, family. Yeah, holiday, that's fine. I do hope everybody's planning, everybody in the U.S. anyway, is planning a good Thanksgiving. We have to say that because in Canada, they had Thanksgiving last month. And the, and the rest, yes, they do it in October. And the rest of the world's going, thanks whoing? Yeah. I also got some, some reminder of what an international audience we have when I, I guess I tweeted. Yeah, it was. I, I tweeted a reminder about daylight savings time on Saturday afternoon. I saw that, yeah. And I got a lot of people said, ah, we did that last week. It was like... What? Uh, what? Where? Yeah, the U.S. changed it a couple. Of, I know. Yeah, a couple of moons ago, and that uh, was an annoying year. Broke a lot, a lot of things. Of, yeah, a lot of lot lot of machines didn't know yet. That's so, right. That's right. In fact, I have a clock that says new daylight savings times or old daylight savings time. <laughs> it it was built at a point when you know it was before the switch, but it knew it was coming. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I think there are, there are two interesting movements afoot that will they have no hope, but I would actually three. I'm going to give you three movements that have no hope because uh, we're so entrenched in our in our way of life that I think just anybody with common sense supports. One is getting rid of daylight savings time. I'm just there. That's my choice. Choice A. Eliminate my, it. Yep. Two is getting rid of the penny. <laughs> Nobody uses, and that copper is expensive. Uh, mostly, More than a penny. Yeah. More right? than a penny, right. But uh, yeah. but still, no, no point. And three, get rid of the electoral college because clearly that does not oh. work. Yep. And all three, any uh, thinking person, actually, though, of the three, daylight savings time might be the one that somebody could dispute. Uh, any thinking person, I think, would agree in all three, and there's not a chance in hell that no. any of them will happen. No. I would also argue that, I mean, that, well, there's been, there's many things with our problems with our, with our political system but it is a, it is a problem that the senate has as much power as it does that's because yes. it, you get over representation of of, low of population. very low yeah low population states and that's yep. exactly why to really go off track you'll never get rid of the electoral college because it gives these states like wyoming more power uh yep. than a state like california because they're a small population but you know you've got your two senators so you got your two electoral votes guaranteed and they're never going to go for it Yep. So, anyway. Um, I promised <laughs> Eileen that yes. we would remember to tell our listeners about the TWIT plan for the holidays as it affects security now. Oh, good. 
and that is apparently you're not we're not going to I mean we we couldn't run the portable dog killer episode again anyway cuz you know we got away with it once and I got a lot of complaints from saying well Steve you broke your we've you know we never missed a week commitment it's like well, okay um but so tell us all what it is that you guys are going to do do I know yeah, it's like <laughs> a, a best of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> I'm looking, Eileen, Eileen. <laughs> yeah, we're doing So this is actually, it's good. I'm glad you mentioned it because I do want to send people to the best of page so they can, you know, help us. Because, I mean, I would say cast your vote, but it's more than that. Help us by picking your favorite moments from the past year. But it's the, moments. It's favorite moments. We don't want to do a whole show like we did last year. We want to get right. bits. Now, this is a little tougher on this show because this show... Uh, you know, is really very fact-based, and there's not a lot of, you know, wacky, you know, Steve dresses in a kilt moments. So well, and, yes, we may and someone, we may do the portable dog killer if we don't get enough votes. Let's put someone it that commented that, that when you, a couple of weeks ago, uh, told me that it wasn't just iOS that was being uh, sandboxed, that Apple was, that, 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 that the announcement was affecting the app store for the main right. OS 10 apparently my look on the camera <laughs> as i just stood there with my mouth open looking like a moron that's a moment said oh now that's one we got all, all the problem is it doesn't translate very well into audio all you get is silence from me so <laughs> thought, well that's we may I, it may be we may have to punt on this one but if you if we can come up with a, a half an hour to an hour worth of great steve moments from 2011 We'll do it. Twit.tv slash best of. And it's not just this show. We're hoping to do every show a best of because we like to take the week after Christmas off. I'm going to go back east and visit family. And uh, so we, you know, and we want to give all our hosts the time off as well. So and if what you we certainly, uh, I was going to say, what we certainly can do, although this doesn't help us this year, is everyone be cognizant of this approach for 2012 and make notes of right. things that you think would right. fit. We did it last year, but uh, yeah. it, oh. nobody nobody remembers. Oh. <laughs> it's always a last-minute thing. At least we're planning this one in November instead of the last week of December. So twit.tv slash best of. Your help is much appreciated. Favorite moments. And, you know, it, it could be, um, you know, in this show it wouldn't be like wacky moments. It would be important security news. Uh, your Bitcoin piece, for instance, I thought was very interesting. I wasn't here for that. Uh, should be, re I think parts of that should be repeated. Um, I think we should probably repeat um, your discussion of uh, Stuxnet. Um, you know, there's certain things that were news newsworthy, so it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. goofy. It, it really could just be the big things that bear repeating. The big stories of 2011, I think, would be perfect. So keep that in mind. Uh, and of course, uh, if all of nothing, you listeners. If, yes, I'm talking to you, folks. And if not, and if nothing happens, portable dog killer. <laughs> the problem is, repeats of a podcast are kind of silly because you can download that episode and listen to it anytime you want. That's why yes. we prefer the best of because that's something that we put some work into. Then you one episode has just the highlights of the year, and I think that's a really great thing to do. Let's hope we can have it. Yes, the passwords would be good. I mean, I could think of a lot. Actually, I. I I'm going to probably sit down and, and go through and say this one, this one, this one, this one. Because I think there's some really important newsworthy things that we covered this year. But the, in the meantime, in the meantime, all that aside, I think you and so I have some stuff to talk about from this week. We do indeed. Uh, uh, we're going to follow up on I have some statistics from what happened to the SOPA the Stop Online Privacy Act event, which you and I covered as it was happening on the day of it last Wednesday when I was up in the studio with you. Um, and uh, some interesting tidbits of news, some uh, feedback. Also, we'll talk about my uh, experience with the Kindle fires that arrived. I had ordered two of them and, uh, and so forth. So I think we've got another great podcast for everybody. You know, it arrived today, uh, a Nook tablet. So uh, we might ah. compare the Kindle tablet to the uh, Nook tablet, the uh, very similar, actually, in hardware. Uh, this one's a little faster because I think the extra RAM has made a difference. It uh, might, well, although it, it, it has the same dual core OMAP processor. Processor's as, the same, in, but I notice the page turns are much more smooth. So, And I notice that it's being advertised by your friend from Glee. Yes, it is. <laughs> Jane Lynch. 
does yes. a great job, no matter what she does. Anyway, we'll we'll get to all of that in just a moment. If you don't mind, Steve, I would like to talk a little bit about Ford before we go too much farther down this road, because our they, friends they, at Ford they keep the wheels turning. Keep the wheels turning, literally, when the rubber meets the road. Ford.com slash technology is a great place for you, uh, you bitheads, and I know that everybody who listens to this show is a guaranteed bithead, to find out more about what Ford's got going uh, in the technology segment. We've mentioned this before. I, I'm just such a fan. You know, we're talking about this uh, on Twit this uh, Sunday. Kara Swisher, who was on from uh, the Wall Street Journal and All Things D, uh, said that the one of, it was kind of a surprise at one of the All Things D conferences. They had the CEO Ford on, Alan Mulally, and he, she said she was one of the best people. And I have to say the same thing. Usually CEOs are so careful. But Alan is an engineer, and we love engineers because... Everything they know, they know black and white, truth and false. They speak truthfully, and that's what I love about engineers. And Alan has just re-engineered Ford Motor Company to to be a 21st century company. And of course, because he's an engineer, he designed the 777 cockpit for Boeing. He has really put some solid engineering into the cockpits of the new Ford cars. Not just the cockpit, the engines, everything, the technology going into Ford Motor. Uh, vehicles these days is incredible. Whether it's the uh, the new EcoBoost engines, the the plug-in hybrids, the hybrids, the all electric. I can't wait to get my Focus all electric. Should be coming out next six months or so. And some of the nicest features. If you take a look at the 2012 Ford Focus, you'll you'll be amazed and impressed by the Wi-Fi connectivity built in. I love this. I mean, let me see if I can find the video. It's so cool. it's so cool. You put a, a USB key into the uh, uh, you know, the, the glove compartment, there's two USB ports in all Y Ford Touch vehicles. So there's either the glove compartment, the dashboard, and most commonly in the center console area. And you plug in a 3G USB uh, key into there, and the and there's antennas in the car, and the whole thing turns into a Wi-Fi access spot, which is just so cool. The idea being to stay connected as you drive. Um, Ford Sync with My Ford Touch is available uh, on many Ford vehicles. You absolutely want to check out uh, the 2012 Focus. That's really kind of the state of the art uh, 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 in the Ford vehicles. And I'm, I'm holding out for it. I'm on the waiting list for the 2012 electric, all electric Ford Focus. Visit Ford.com slash technology to find out more. Best way to do this, though, is to go to your local Ford dealer and drive one. There's nothing like it. I love my Mustang. I love my Ford Touch. I love my Sync. And I love Wi-Fi. In the cabin, you stay you stay in touch all the time. They also have got to, you know, I never, I don't talk enough about the turn by turn directions of the GPS. It's the best. I should just say that the best. Forty million businesses, telephone numbers, directions. They have a app that that will sync up with your account, so you have a website associated to your car, associated to an app on your iPhone or your Android phone. You get access to directions. You can send directions to the car from Google Maps or MapQuest. Uh, you can get traffic texts sent to your phone, so if you're at work, your phone will say, hey, you might want to wait, traffic's bad, or you might want to leave now, it's getting worse. All designed to keep your hands on the wheel and the eyes on the road. Ford.com slash technology. Thank you, Ford. We appreciate your support for security now. So um, let's talk. What's what's new in the te in the security news? So I guess we'll start with SOPA. Well, yeah, um, the, this was the, uh, a reaction to this legislation, uh, which was being viewed by many very popular websites as, as the most onerous and worrisome, sort of over-the-top government uh, privacy-violating legislation yet, uh, more so than the uh, the protect IP legislation, which is probably, that's, hopefully, that's thankfully the, stalled in the Senate. That's the Senate version. Ron Wyden, pray, yes. all praise to Ron Wyden, who said, I'll filibuster it. I'll stop it. So yeah. uh, we know that's not going to get through. Although the thing is, these keep coming up. I mean, if they, you know, uh, maybe there is, there'll be another yes. one. Yes. You know, I mean, one of my favorite slogans, unfortunately, I'm very active in following U.S. politics, and I, my favorite phrase is, the best government money can buy. Yeah. <laughs> Bought and sold. But the uh, thing that I think this is a very good lesson, the, the thing they do with that money 
is essentially get votes, right? So ultimately, we have more control as a group because our vote is the final arbiter of whether somebody gets in office. That is true. Um, and, well, so, of course, well, we don't want to devolve into a political discussion. No, but, please. You know, spe <laughs> special interests special interests end up with disproportionate strength. Right. But we are we special got, interests when we act in concert, and that's what the Internet has done, and that's what's so exciting. Well, the, the bad news is we're fighting the MPAA and the RIAA and these large organizations who that, that keep putting pressure to, to make these things happen. And they want to fact, break the Internet. Frankly, Lamar Smith, who is a who is the Texas uh, Republican representative, who's one of the the sponsors of this bill, the the SOPA Stop Online Privacy Act bill, he said, "Well, you know, I'm not technical." Yeah. Well, okay, and this is the problem: is that one of the many things this does is it breaks DNSSEC. That is, you DNSSEC is all about preventing. DNS spoofing, which is essentially what this is, is is legislated, government-backed DNS spoofing. And so many of the people have been concerned because essentially it means we can't have DNS security if we're all if we're gonna have a, a mandated legislated deliberate breakage of, of DNS. Because Lamar we, Smith says it's one quarter of all the internet traffic is offensive infringement and we're going to stop it. Yeah, he said one quarter one of internet quarter. traffic is infringing. And which, you know he's being spoon fed that from the RIAA. Precisely. Now the good news is there was a serious groundswell that resulted last uh, peaking last Wednesday um, during this this day of 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 everyone being called up and out to to act, um, one million emails were generated to U.S. representatives by people around the country that cared about this. Eighty, I don't know how I don't know how they had this number, but eighty-seven thousand eight hundred and thirty-four telephone calls. That was that was from Tumblr alone. Tumblr, no yes, that's the Tumblr number. Tumblr.com uh -huh. was very aggressive because they would be one of the companies that would really be screwed by this. They'd suddenly be responsible for every bit of content on their, I mean, they're one of the biggest web hosts in the world. Yes. And they didn't want, so they were very aggressive. And that count comes from Tumblr.com alone. Talk about wow. a great response. So the average length of those phone calls was 53 seconds. Yep. Um, the longest one was 31 minutes. Got to feel sorry for the rep, rep, the representative who got on the other side of you know. Like, Hello, <laughs> and a total of twelve hundred and ninety three hours of phone calls. Wow, were spent talking to representatives. Now, I wanted to give our listeners who care about this, as you and I do, um, a URL because this is being organized around americancensorship.org is the website and at the top of their website they they mention essentially distill it down to three bullet points that i thought were worth sharing so under website blocking they explain that the government can order service providers to block websites for infringing links posted by any users under the, and, and and they said risk of jail for ordinary users it's, they explain it becomes a felony with a potential five-year sentence to stream a copyrighted work, even if you are a totally non-commercial user, for example, singing a pop song on Facebook. Well, and we do this all the time, and it's our position that it's fair use as a news organization is protected, but that doesn't mean that they don't take our, our shows down all the time, and we would be faced with prosecution, and we might be able to defend ourselves. We might not, but it would certainly well, and, cost us a remember, lot to do it's, so. And remember, it's... Certainly possible for people to, to take the position, oh, well, yeah, but that would never happen to a regular user. But let's remind everyone of the case of the innocent mom of, yeah. of like, a, a, what, I think her kids were like three and four years old, who was attacked by and sued by the MPAA for movies that were found on her machine, which 
were loaded by, and being redistributed by malware that she had no idea was there. And, and, and some huge tens of thousands, for some reason, the, the number $64,000. I mean, th literally, the, the courts were coming down in ju with j cash judgments against her, requiring her to pay this money. So this kind of thing does, I mean, and can happen, and apparently will. Anyway, I don't know. I think the myself. most important thing <laughs> if, if, up. for people who listen to this show is the message that it would break DNS, that it isn't a good solution. It would, yes. and I didn't know, but that it would impinge on the ability to do DNS sec is huge. I mean, we're having, we have a fight on our hands to get everybody to implement DNS sec as it is, but it's clearly. And we need it to prevent spoofing, and this is mandated, legislated spoofing. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yep. Yep, and and finally, the the last bullet point on AmericanCensorship.org explains, under chaos for the internet, they said thousands of sites that are legal under the DMCA, which I already have big problems with because it prevents, for example, researchers from being able to reverse engineer crypto technology in order to research it, would face new legal threats. People trying to keep the internet more secure wouldn't be able to rely on the integrity of the DNS system. So uh, it's just, it's bad. And the, as you, I think the point you make, Leo, is I don't know if we're going to win this ultimately. It is, there is, there is such, there is such continuous pressure from the powers that be that, that do not want the internet to be free and open um, that, that want control over it. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm I, glad I, I think we can. putting up a fight. I think we can win this. I think we won this round because I think uh, 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 enough members of Congress got the message. When you get 87,000 phone calls, <laughs> that's a significant number. Now, somebody in the chat room said, well, it's not the people who listen to this show. It's the dumb people we have to convince. That's not true. There are 70,000 people listening right now to this show. Uh, there are plenty of technically sophisticated people. There are more than enough because, remember, most people never call their member of Congress, never have anything to do with them. So each call counts a lot. So yeah. we, ha we do have the power. We can fight this, and I think we will win in the long run. And the other thing we, all of our listeners, are, uh, are opinion leaders. I have a in, in a Q&A that we'll get to later, um, a point is made and I chose this because I wanted to make a point to our listeners to tell their less security aware friends to remind them yeah. of the importance of something. So, so you know, that really does need to happen. And as Puppy um, says, uh, really, the problem is complacency more than anything else. Let's not be complacent. We've got to continue this fight continually. Right. Vigilant uh, because it's our Internet. And, yeah, most people may not realize the threat. We do. So we're the ones who have to fight. Yes. Yes. Now, a ton of news was made in the last week. And, and my Twitter feed was full of people bringing this to my attention about something that may or may not have happened. And that was the news that uh, an Illinois-based water district had its SCADA system the the industrial control system for oh. running it hacked and it's and the consequence of that was that a critical water pump was burned out now the question is whether this was true or not because now the department of homeland security who has a division called ICS cert which is the industrial control systems cyber emergency response team emphatically says that there is no evidence whatsoever of any external intrusion from Russia or anywhere else. And what's odd is that the original blog posting that got picked up by the news organizations and even an executive at that water district who was then on, I don't know if it was radio or TV, but on some public live, live media contained all kinds of information about log entries that were found and IP addresses belonging to Russians. And that wow. for two or three months, there was like odd behavior being observed by this system. And that apparently it was that the SCADA system was being 
was being like shutting down and then coming back up. It was the fact that it was offline for a while that caused this pump to burn out because it wasn't it, – it lost its supervisory control technology that it was relying on and overheated. So I don't know what to think. I'm, I'm – I, I, you know, you'd – you could see some pressure on the part of the Department of Homeland Security to because this this news got so much press and so much attention that they could be wanting to tamp down on anyone worrying that okay, well, a water pump today, a nuclear reactor tomorrow, right? Um, which of in course, fact, break a water is pump the, is the concern, right? Break a water pump in a nuclear reactor, you could have a meltdown. So this is not insignificant. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So I don't understand. There was, there, 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 the DHS and the FBI say that we found no evidence of public water utility hack. We right. also read that their password was three letters. <laughs> Actually, it's not their password. There was some other confusion there. Oh, okay. It's, it's that there are SCADA passwords in use, actually in other places, as I understand it, that are three letters. And in some cases... They ship with three-letter passwords, oh. and no one changes them. Oh. Yeah. ABC. Actually, I think the one I saw was 100. Uh, was that was uh, 100. Was, uh, was a sample three-letter password that was in use somewhere. Somebody so, needs to remix the Michael Jackson song. It's breaking it into Scott as easy as one, two, three, ABC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we don't know. Um, there was some good news, and that is that Google is moving forward with some efforts to increase the security of of connections to them when using either their browser or Firefox today. And apparently there's support for this in, and I think it was one of the later versions of IE under Windows 7, and that is... Remember how we've talked about the way SSL works, where you have a suite of, of, of available cipher systems which, the, with, which a web browser offers to the server. And we were talking in the context of CBC, the, the, the one particular um, uh, protocol used by block ciphers had a problem under SSL prior to uh, version, or actually TLS version 1.1 and 1.2. So TLS version 1.1, which is SSL 3, had this problem, and that it was possible to, to simply fall back and not use the uh, uh, CBC technology, but use RC4 as your block cipher, which then would keep you from having this problem. Well, in a different sort of tangent off of that, the, the guys at Google have implemented something known as ephemeral Diffie-Hellman encryption. And, and actually, that's a key agreement protocol, which is very efficient. The efficiency of that allows them to change keys often. And changing keys often, that is like for every secure session that you set up is very good because that creates something known as perfect forward uh, perfect forward secrecy and several several articles that I saw talking about this were written by non crypto savvy people who said that forward secrecy was a protocol and it's actually not it's a feature of it's something that you get which is a good thing when you change your key often because the point of it is that it keeps you from ever going back in time if someone were to were to hack a key that is now in use they wouldn't be able to go backwards and hack stored stored encrypted sessions because those would have been in, in, encrypted under a different key so what what google has done is they're they've 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 augmented the normal security suites that are available with some new ones which you inherently use ephemeral keys which are easy to compute and won't load down servers they have they have built this into 
some updates to the open SSL suite and I made that publicly available. So what will happen is this will filter back into open SSL um, with, in, in, with a future version of it. It'll be available. It'll then get pushed out and built into next generation fundamental SSL suites that are available in the, the Unix flavor OSs. And apparently Microsoft is already in the process of adopting this. And then as our browsers are, are made aware of this, and currently Chrome and Firefox both are, we'll just all start using this and that'll be a good thing. So this is a, just a really, it's a perfect example of, of when a protocol was thought out well and it was inherently designed to be upward compatible, how you can slipstream good evolution into that protocol, never breaking anything and just automatically taking advantage of, of, of innovation in, in the crypto that just sort of filters out into everything. So well, maybe Vince was Surf very... was, was right. He said it's the self-healing internet. Don't throw it away. Yes. And I did want to make a little TSA announcement. I saw for, for holiday travel that children under 12 no longer have to take their shoes off. Yeah. I know that because I traveled with a child under 12 uh, about a month ago. And has that always been the case? No, nope, it just that happened a, literally about a month ago. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yep. So, <laughs> so I guess they figure there will be no shoe bombers under 12. Well, the bad news is I think today, as we're recording this, people are probably already in line. So they may not be hearing this well, announcement. They put, but the, the way I found out, they put big signs up uh, at oh, the good. airport. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So... Um, uh, but you still have to do all the other stuff. In fact, those security lines have gotten crazier and crazier and crazier. Yeah, I yeah. got uh, usually I um, oh. get scanned. The SFO uses millimeter wave scanning, which is not an, an X-ray and supposedly not dangerous. But I got a backscatter scan in um, Vegas the last time I uh, left Vegas. Actually, I got a backside scan. <laughs> I don't want to know. I, I... <laughs> I'm not kidding. This was, I, don't, I guess it was one of the trips I had taken recently, and I thought I did everything right. You know, I raised my arms above my head and, and stood there. And then he, and the person said, do you have something lumpy in your right back pocket? And I had some just some bills folded in half. And it was yeah. sensitive enough yep. that, you know, I took my wallet out of my left back pocket where I normally keep it, but I didn't realize that, you know, just folded paper would would upset it. And then I had to go through the whole, you know, pat down routine because right. now they're all, suddenly that sends sets off their alarms and they're like, okay, well, you know. So I I guess that was a backside scan that I had. So. <laughs> that happened to me, uh, and it turned out I think it was just my shirt was bunched up when it was tucked in. I had nothing in my pockets. I didn't have a belt on. It was all fabric, and they still said, well, we got to scan this back here. And I think it was just probably my shirt was bunched up. I mean, this is ridiculous. Well, and Leo, I, 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 just, I don't want to get off the, the track, but I haven't ever said this before, and I, and except to friends of mine. You know, all of these problems that we had were from foreign flights coming into the country. The, the fluid mixing thing was, I think that was, was that out of London that was coming yeah. into the U.S.? Yeah, I think it was. And, and the shoe bomber, the underwear bomber, all these various, variations of bombers, they were not when people were flying from Orange County, California, 500 miles north to Northern California. And, I mean, think it's, about it. It's security theater. I mean, that's what Bruce Schneier yes. calls it. He is, of course, a great security expert, and he is very vocal on what we could do to have effective security as opposed to what we are doing, which is essentially theater. Oh, and look at the cost to yeah, us, yeah. to us citizens. Anyway, so mm -hmm. last Wednesday, you were showing off your fire, your new Kindle fire, and I was drooling over it and telling you that mine were waiting for me. Um, I was so excited about it back when it was introduced that I bought two of them under the theory that if one is good, two would be better. Um, they've both been returned to Amazon. Yeah, what happened? Well, and in fact, I tweeted I said uh, th a couple days after that, there I saw a, a Kindle Fire teardown where its cost was estimated, and it, it was estimated that cost that the, the, the $199 Kindle costs Amazon $201.70. 
And so I tweeted that. I said, Kindle Fire Teardown shows it costs two hundred one seventy to make. Of course, that doesn't factor in the cost of return shipping. Oh, interesting. You had to pay for return shipping? Oh, no, no, they oh, did. They but, did. Okay. but I'm saying that that was also their cost, which wasn't right. factored into right, the, right, right. the Kindle. They, they, they lost more money on you than anybody else. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and in fairness, okay, so, okay, so I plugged it in, charged it up overnight, and went to Starbucks bright and early on Thursday the next morning to have a nice sit down with it. And I started not being that impressed with it. Um, the, the power button sticks out, so it will turn itself on or off if you rest it on its lower edge, which is why many people have power buttons that slide because that's not something that, that's not as natural an action. But, you know, and, and many of the Kindles, the early Kindles slid, the newer Kindles at least don't stick out except the touches sticks out, whereas the, 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 the regular, what they're called the Kindle now, just the Kindle Kindle, its button does not stick out. But then little things. It's, it's a little uh, easy I, to hit that button. I agree with you, though. I think that that's not a good place for it. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's, one, that's maybe the only thing which, is, which doesn't fall into the category of they can fix it. Yeah. Because the beauty of any of these... It's all software. Yes. Yeah. Any of these state-of-the-art devices is that it is software. And so everything I'm going to complain about, I understand, we can, hopefully, will get fixed. Um, but, for example, the bright... And, and, and these are... As I was playing with it, I was thinking, Steve Jobs would have never shipped this. And so, you know, it, it, like it wouldn't have gotten past him. For example, the lower 25% of the brightness control is... Is black. Effective. <laughs> it does nothing. It does nothing. So, the lower 25%, you slide it back and forth. It has no effect whatsoever. Right. It just bottoms out. And so they need to rescale that. And that's, as you say, easily fixed with a easily firmware fixed. upgrade. Yeah. Um, also, uh, on the, t the title page of a book that I was experimenting with, as I dragged it back and forth with my screen, I was able to get it to leave debris behind. So it wasn't properly refreshing the screen yeah. as I as I moved it, and it was jerky and not very smooth. I think you got a, 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 a more bad ones. I think that's um, another bad thing. I haven't seen any of the uh, uh, graphics uh, I issues that you you just described. And while the screen is not quite as fluid as a iPad, admittedly, uh, I haven't. It's it's pretty fluid. I haven't seen any well, issues with it at all. I wanted. I think to a lot of people are having trouble. I wanted, oh, they are. Yeah. I wanted to see whether the cover flow was better in landscape orientation than it was in portrait because it is unusable in portrait. It is just, it's awful. Now, oh, maybe you know what, that's Steve? You have bad, you have a bad machine. <laughs> no, I, I'm not no, kidding. I, 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 I wish I had machines. mine here that I could show you. The cover flow works fine in, in portrait, in uh, landscape. I've had other people complain. I've seen other people complain about the cover flow, that it just, the way it works. Now, maybe it's that I have 247 things in the archive. Oh, well, that could be. Except it. That ought to make it just deeper. But, I mean, it doesn't, it, it, it's difficult for me to, like, bring something to front. It was, it was snapping off to the left prematurely. And, again, fixable by software. Um, font selection. I think fixable by getting one that works. I think you've got, I'm not kidding. Let me here, I have one here. Let me, I have to set up the screen so you can see it. Um, let me just see if this, if I'm getting the same effect uh, on this fire. Because it, 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 it's completely smooth on uh, both portrait and landscape mode. Let me pull up a, um, a shot of it. I don't have an over the shoulder shot. I wasn't planning this. Um, <laughs> here, all right. Here, here's, uh, this is not my Kindle fire. This is uh, um, Liz's. I mean, it's a little slow updating the image the first time through, but that's completely fluid to me. Are you seeing it? I, I actually can't. My video from you froze quite some time ago. <laughs> oh, but... these things do happen. But, <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, I, I feel like it's um, that, that they may have a lot of hardware defects and that you may have a bad graphics card in there. Interesting. Well, yeah. I, I think it's design. I think it's a very bad UI. I was unimpressed with its navigation, which seems inconsistent and often unclear. Really? Like, 
how how to move around. I mean, I, I'm I'm asking a lot from it. I will say, yes, it's two hundred dollars, and that's a an amazing price for for a, a tablet that has this much potential. But at this point, I'm I'm very unimpressed. I you know it needs a major revision. For some reason, it's already at revision six when it comes. And it may be that both of mine, because both went back, both of them hung um, completely. And I did order instantly, so maybe they were literally the first ones off the assembly That's line. That's what I think. That you, you know, I think there are probably several sources for these. Um, and I'm wondering if some of the sources are, are just not making good ones. Yeah, well, as I mentioned to you before we began recording, when I Googled Kindle Fire Frozen, I immediately found other people having the problem, and I made three postings in a in an online Amazon-based thread that um, that that drew uh, attention. I tweeted about the problems, and I just considered it, you know, unfortunately, a very bad launch failure. But I, I did hear that you and and Paul talked about it that same day on Thursday, and really liked the Kindle Fire. Well, it's I'm re what's interesting to me is I'm hearing very different experiences from people. Um, to me, I mean, I, I was just showing the page turn and the and the cover flow, and it's and it's snappy. There's a little tiny bit of hesitation, uh, tiny. I mean, you'd have to be a little picky in the page turn. Certainly, nothing like the actual physical hesitation in a page turn or like a Kindle. Um, I think for 200 bucks, this is, well, I think for any price, this is an amazing product. It's certainly the best Android tablet uh, I've ever used. I agree there are some flaws. I think the on-off switch is a little easy to hit, although I don't hold it that way, so I never hit it. Um, I'm, I really like it. Um, so you, so, so you, you would call it the best Android tablet to date? Oh, easily. But that doesn't wow. say much since most of them are pretty horrible. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's really literally not saying a whole lot, but I, I just... I just feel like um, I think I'll probably wait three or four months for them to settle down for their you know for whatever problems they're having with production. To, I mean, I wouldn't want to get one and then have them improve the hardware design. And well, you know, they uh, they do uh, tend to do that. I'm wondering. I'm thinking that there's a variety of hardware out there uh, or manufacturing problems with some of them, hmm. and might have something to do. With that, I mean, I, I found this to be, um, and you know, Kevin Rose was on Twitter saying the same thing. This thing is horrible. I can't, hand, you know, um, and 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 people like Paul uh, are saying things like, well, compared with the iPad, of course, it's not as good, but for the price, it is very good. But I actually, uh, even, uh, I mean, at two hundred bucks, I think it's amazing. Yes. Um, and I've been recommending it to people. That's so. Um, I just have a very, well, I, I have a very I different experience. I would not recommend it as a book reader. Um, well, I like the e ink, and I, and I do say that. I mean, I, I do point out that if you're, uh, you know, if you're reading in daylight or you want really crisp text, uh, then this is probably not a good choice. There's also an issue with this that signs you into your Amazon account. So I had a caller on the radio show said I want to get a tablet for my girls, and while I would recommend this uh, for kids because the price is right, and I don't think they'll have the same issues that <laughs> that we have. Uh, the, you, the problem is you can't lock down the, the purchases. So uh, you're giving a kid a, a, basically a, a device to buy anything they want at any time. And I don't know if that's yeah, such a good you're idea. You're giving him your, 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 your credit card with no controls over Right, it. right. Yeah. Um, I also, the touch I have a problem with, which is that, um, and again, fixable by software, but first of all, I'm not a big fan, I think, of of touching the screen in order to change pages. I really like having a physical button. And my favorite Kindle of all time actually turns out to be the DX. I've been reading, a, I mean, a lot recently because uh, I'm just so in love with these Honor Harrington books. And and I've, I've come back to the DX just because of its large screen, which is so comfortable for me. And in fact, I have two of them. I'm probably going to uh, bring one up to Northern California and see if my mom wants to upgrade hers from the one that I got her a couple of years ago, which was the probably the Kindle 3 to the DX, just because, you know, she's in, in her 80s and, and I think she would yeah. probably appreciate the larger screen. My wife has but, inherited uh, the uh, the $70 or the $80 Kindle, the basic Kindle, 
Yep. Because I've got the fire. And she loves it. I think, you know, the Kindle is a very accessible product. Yeah, now my problem with that one is I think it's almost too small. <laughs> the reason I, my, my most, my favorite practical Kindle, I, re I recognize the DX is not for everyone because it's $379. And that's, you know, really pricey. But my favorite one is what they now call uh, the Kindle keyboard, which is the what they used to call the Kindle 3, because it's got that paddle at the bottom to hold on to. For me, it's it's just easier. I like having switches on both sides, which of course the the eighty dollar Kindle also does. Right. But it's almost there's almost nowhere to hold that little Kindle, the the newest one, because it's just like they've removed the margins and there's no more keyboard at the bottom, and so it's sort of a little difficult to like get a get a grip on it. But again, it is super small, and they they really have improved the page turn too. They they no longer do the big whole screen inversion paint. They only do that every six page turns. Oh. So so five out of the six page turns just change the text. Oh. And it's very I pleasant. That. I didn't notice that. I, I first saw that on the earlier Kindles in the table of contents. You, I noted, or maybe it was in magazine reading. It was something, or, or news news subscriptions. There was there were several places where they weren't doing the whole big black inversion, and I thought, wait a minute, how are they getting away with that here? And what they've done is they've Reload. they've extended. Well, they've extended it so that it. I think what happens is there's. Over time, there's some buildup, ah. sort of like some drift, and so they, they they said, okay, well, we'll let you do the sort of the the easy on the eye page turn five times, right. but when you do it a sixth time, we're gonna sort of like you, you know like the etch a sketch, yeah. erase the whole screen and then redraw it in order to clean up any anything that might accumulate. Now I'm curious. Uh, I just I just got uh, to compete with the uh, the the uh, Kindle Fire. I just got the Barnes and Noble Nook tablet. I thought if I'm gonna review the Fire, I should review the Nook. And mm. they some of the things that you'll you'll like immediately. First of all, it feels thinner and lighter. It's got beveled edges instead of square edges. It's it's got an on-off switch here uh, where you're less likely to hit it. Um, it actually reminded me a lot of the Kindle Fire with with one kind of small exception. Um, it's a little faster, and I think that's because it has more RAM. It has the same processor, but it has more uh, more RAM in it. Yeah, I think um, the Fire has 8 gig of RAM. No, RAM is 512 on the Fire. RAM. Oh, 512, that's yeah, right. Yeah, and this is a and, gigabyte and, of and, RAM. Okay. Yeah, but... Uh, it's very similar in a lot of in a lot of ways. We get it's fun, funny, and I'm not sure why this is. Its refresh rate is not the nominal uh, uh, 60 hertz that most screens are. You notice we didn't get any fl you you can't see it, but we didn't get any flicker on the on the Kindle Fire. We're getting on all our cameras. We get a lot of flicker on the uh, the tablet. So they've they've got an odd refresh rate going on uh, wow. here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. But I, I do think it's a it's a uh, it's a very similar product, maybe a little faster. So, uh, if you could live with the fact that it's not Amazon, and the price, uh, fifty bucks more, okay, which is not, uh, in my opinion, a good idea, um, because people are going to pick the bigger brand for fifty bucks less. I don't think very many people say, "Oh, it's got double the RAM." <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think that right. comes up at all. Anyway, enough about enough about ebook readers. I I I, okay. I, I think you I think you're still you still got a hardware malfunction in yours your new one i don't think so i think i'm just picky okay yeah. when, when you come up here next time we'll have a head-to-head face-off well i'll have my own i mean I, I i will i ought to have one i have multiples of all the other ones might as so well right ultimately i think i should have one i would like to have an android tablet i don't have an android it's, tablet it's, yet, in so. my opinion the best android tablet it's limited in some ways you you know it's not updatable uh you have to amazon has to update it and um, and you and you don't have access to the full marketplace. You have to uh, get stuff from the Amazon store, but it's still an yeah. Android tablet. Yeah, and and again, I, I'm also in a position, as are you, of being able to buy individual devices for individual purposes. So if, you know, I have a DX because I like reading on that large e-ink screen. Right. I have the I have you know the smallest Kindle because it's nice to have one that goes in my pocket, and I've right. got my iPad for everything else. So, but if someone had to just choose one device. And they were, and and budgetary concerns were forefront. Then I think this 
does it all for for 200 bucks you get a tablet half the price of the ipad or less than that and uh and also a, a useful reader so uh some tweets david wright uh who tweeted he's he said he's an englishman in germany he said uh, he's he sent a mention to sggrc spin right saves the day again 2004 laptop back up and running again ready for another couple years of faithful service. And um, David Ward, uh, tweeting as Dave QB11 in, from Sydney, Australia, said, SGGRC left Firefox 4 open overnight at work. And today, we have it consuming 4.6 gig <laughs> of memory. 4.6 wow. gig. So, David, you get the record. And he says... Only about 85 tabs. So, well, I, well uh, look on the bright side, at least it's a 64 bit app. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, I will mention something that I caught it doing, and that is I watched it as I was, I was in process, uh, or I was in task manager. I had task manager open, watching the memory just like ticking up over time in Firefox, just going like every time task manager would refresh, like every few seconds, it would be larger. So Firefox was just growing continuously. And I thought, you know, I wonder. And I closed an open PDF and it stopped. Adobe! Blame yeah. Adobe. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, if, and I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be at all surprised if among those 85 open tabs that Dave Ward had, some of them were PDFs that were being viewed, often the case for me. So um, that may be part of the problem. Um, and then Simon Zarafa, who is a frequent Twitter and contributor, he, he sent a fun quote that I liked, uh, attributed to Samuel T. Redvine, Red, Redwine Jr. The quote was, software and cathedrals are much the same. First we build them, then we pray. So, love it. <laughs> so true. <laughs> and um, also, a new URL uh, for Chrome. Eric um, Valbrecht in Minnesota, he said, SGGRC, memory stats for all running browsers go to Chrome colon. So, you open Chrome. And it's funny because when he said all running browsers, I didn't realize he was serious, but he was. So Chrome colon slash slash memory hyphen redirect slash. You put that URL into Chrome and uh, the, the page is titled about memory, measuring memory usage in a multi-process browser. And what surprised me because I didn't read his tweet closely enough was it showed not only a breakdown of all the processes that Chrome had spawned, but also Firefox. And then I thought, wait, what, what about IE? So I fired off a copy of IE and refreshed the page, and sure enough, IE was there too. So I don't know quite why they're doing that, but it's sort of interesting to see how it all breaks down. Well, so you can make the comparison. I, <laughs> I guess that's the case, although it actually wasn't very flattering in, in Chrome's case, mm. but... Uh, I you know I have many more tabs open in Firefox so um, than I do in Chrome because I'm still predominantly over in Firefox. It does say there's a bug that they seriously overcount their own memory usage. <laughs> I love Google. Again, engineers they don't you know yep. they're gonna tell the truth. Yep. I'm gonna launch Firefox and I'm gonna launch Safari and I'm gonna see what happens. How interesting that they would build that into Chrome. Hmm. And uh, I also had a, a tweet from Blind Bites who said, also, he said, uh, regarding Spinrite, he says, thanks for Spinrite, saved my PC once again. No exciting story, PC wouldn't boot, and lock up during system recovery. Ran SR, one hour, all okay. And then I didn't realize it until just now, but the, the story that I had a little bit longer to share with our listeners about Spinrite was from David Ward in Sydney, New South Wales. So it's probably the same David Ward who tweeted about Firefox and all of his tabs, because he said, Hi, Steve, I've been hearing the testimonials and mentions of Spinrite for a few years now on Security Now. I thought it sounded nice for those without any options, but I can do a bit of data recovery if I need it. 
Plus, I have backups of all important data. So it's not a problem for me. Plus, I thought, how can a reformat slash re-zero not solve any problem anyway? Well, I recently ran, I recently had a disk in our Myth TV media machine that started acting up. It was a disk in the recording pool of drives. So some of our recordings, he said, i.e. girlfriends, were on it. Mounting the disk separately was showing it was empty. Not the end of the world. Well, maybe for me, but not for anyone else. So I did a manufacturer's check on the drive, and it came up fine. I did some other little things, and the disk continued to check out fine. Still no data upon mounting it. Skeptical, I talked a friend out of loaning me his copy of Spinrite with the promise to him and myself that if it did anything, I would buy it. But I was also pretty sure it probably wouldn't. Running at level four, I saw it seemingly stuck at 41% on a spare test. Oh, he said on a spare test Pentium 4. So I changed out the motherboard slash CPU, et cetera. Wow, okay. And resumed from there. I'm not sure why that was necessary, but anyway, he says a day later, we're done. And we have all our data accessible. So there, Steve, have my $89. <laughs> I just purchased it. Well worth, it. Damn it, <laughs> well worth it for Spinrite and all the other information you provide me on the podcast. Keep up the great That's work. That's a neat story. Yeah. And, and, and we would tell people that if you use Spinrite and you see it pause at a point, that's the that's the problem sector, and it's reading and reading and reading, and it won't give up until it gets that data off of there. That's all that was going on. Sometimes it can take a while, yeah. but and it will ultimately move forward, and then uh, and probably have done that drives some a world of good. In a this world case. of good. All right, I got questions. You've got answers. Before we get to that, I would like to show everybody Netflix. Not that they don't already know, but. In case you're one of the few who isn't using Netflix streaming, you might want to take a look. This is right here in Chrome. They've got a Netflix uh, Chrome extension. But you can run Netflix on a lot of things, including your Xbox 360, your PlayStation 3, uh, your Nintendo Wii, but your iPad, your iPhone, Android phones, and tablets too. And that's, a, a by the way, the app's always free. And that's a beauty thing because that means no matter where you are, you can watch Great movies. Like, I don't know why it's recommending cerebral dysfunctional family dramas to me, but it is. Uh, also documentaries, new movies, new TV, watch it again, stars play. We were watching Family Guy, so it says, well, here's some more stuff like Family Guy, King of the Hill, Buttery, South Park, Reno 911, more like Friday Night Lights. I've been watching the entire uh, uh, whatever it is, four or five seasons of Friday Night Lights. What a great show. I missed it the first time around watching it now. Uh, and so this is the beauty of it, is that you have thousands and thousands of movies you can watch anytime, whenever you're in the mood. And guess what? It's $7.99 a month. Oh, the right stuff. What a great movie that was. I'd like to watch that one again. In high def, of course. Here's the thing. It's free for the first month. If you're not a Netflix member, go to netflix.com slash twit. Try it free for 30 days. Let us know what you think. If you're already a member, do me a favor. This Thanksgiving, you'll be sitting across the table, almost certainly, from somebody who does not have Netflix. Would you do me a favor and tell them about it? And then tell them about the free 30 days and say, look, no cost, no charge. Just try it. Just give it a try on your iPad, your iPhone, your Android phone, or all of the above. Netflix.com slash twit. And we thank them so much for their support. Of security now. Da, da, da. All right, Steve, I got uh, I got some questions here. Are you ready? You feel good? You 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 you're ready to go? Ah, <sighs> yes. <laughs> right. I've got all these browsers open. Let me close a few so I can see the questions. <laughs> Terry Bell starts us off with a reason why HTML5 is not a flash killer. We we're talking about the fact that Adobe is abandoning Flash on the mobile platform and going to support HTML5. Flash applications are compiled, and compilation produces binaries that take effort to reverse engineer. A Flash application may also be obfuscated 
to afford protection against flash decompilers. In contrast, the source code for HTML5 applications is there for anyone to grab. It can then be modified and some similar competing applications or services set up with a fraction of the original development cost. Although obfuscation and moving application logic to server side will help HTML5 developers protect their work, some developers will not see that protection as adequate and choose Flash instead. Thus, HTML5 will replace Flash in many instances, but not all. Well, so what do you think? I was trying to think, okay, what's that valuable that people are coding in Flash? And I guess games... Yeah. Is yeah. You know, you wouldn't want Flash games to be. To be. He has a point. I'm sure that there scrolling. will be. There, there are ways to obfuscate JavaScript, but uh, they're pretty easily cracked. I wouldn't be surprised if there were ways to um, p code it or byte code it so that it it isn't legible. That's an interesting question. Well, actually, it, the, the the you know Flash is compiled into a P code. It you know the actual runtime is an interpreter right. that interprets that interprets Flash. No, I understand. P -code. Yeah, it's it, 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 but uh, that's what I'm saying is that JavaScript would need something similar to make it. Uh, I don't know. I just think Flash is dead, no matter how you feel about it, or how proprietary you'd like to make your code. Uh, if if no mobile device supports it. They are going to continue, yeah. but they're going to make one more version for Android. They'll, they'll be the final version. But but say two years from now, you know, you're losing out of the mobile market, which will be by then the number one way to surf. Are you going to use Flash? I don't know. I mean, you might use it, I guess, if you're Yahoo Games. I don't, yeah, I don't think anybody today even, given the, the anti-Flash position that, you know, Apple's mobile products have, would if they didn't have to would use flash i think you you just say okay html5 and javascript that's you know we we can do what we need to that way so in the uh, chat room web755 is pointing out there is a flash decompiler actually i've used some there was when i was putting um videos on my site i wanted to understand i guess i wanted to tweak something that was it was free and but but it wasn't available in source form, and so I used a decompiler in order to get it back so that I could tweak it and then recompile it. And you know that approach worked just fine. So maybe it isn't so secure. Yeah, it's not. It's not any different than uh, <laughs> obfuscated JavaScript. Well, yeah, and remember we have our standard. Our standard refrain is: if it's going to run on a user platform, then you, you cannot protect it. Right, because it it's has like to be. It, it, it decompiled by the platform. Yes, effect. and so there's lots of clever people with lots of time on their hands, apparently, <laughs> who say, "Oh, let's let's write a decompiler. That'll be fun." You know, it's a senior project for for computer science. Rosen Penev in California has our next question, Steve. I've been a listener since the Bitcoin episode, and your password haystacks page is fascinating. Your explanation of it was awesome. But a question recently popped up. You mentioned how the bad guys try to use dictionary attacks and then progressively trying out more sophisticated patterns like numbers and symbol combinations. My question is, how likely is it for a bad guy to use a different alphabet to try to crack a password? My guess is highly unlikely since most people don't use alphabets other than the Latin alphabet. But I'd appreciate it if you could comment on this since... This could potentially mean that you can have passwords that are short and secure by, I guess, by using Cyrillic or something. Great podcast as always. Well, so, okay, the the problem is, we is is one of compatibility. We run across it with sites that won't allow special characters, for example, even even you know, sort of a little bit off the map, but not even very far off the map um, characters. Or uh, even Unicode uh, in some cases. There, are, what you'd really like is a site that will take whatever it is you give it and hash it and store the hash. In which case, it's only incumbent upon you to be able to recreate the same thing again. Now, even that can be a problem because not all keyboards are equally capable. It's possible, for example, with a, a traditional PC keyboard to use to hold down the alt key and enter the decimal 
code into the number pad and have that work. The problem would be, what if you wanted to log in on your iPad to the same site? You wouldn't be able to recreate that same process. So, so it's so. We, unfortunately, we're reduced at this point to a world of least common denominators in order to get cross-site and cross-application and cross-platform compatibility. So, it's you know while it's tempting to imagine putting some funky characters in from some different language, you need to make sure that you're able to do that wherever you want to be and, of course, that the site honors them correctly. For example, if I did that, say that I used a, a C with, a, with an umlaut over it or something or maybe an O, you would want to make sure that just typing in a regular O didn't also log you in, in which case you wouldn't have achieved anything. It would be, you know, it would be reducing the strength of your password without, without your knowing it. So... You know, yes, the idea is absolutely a good one, but unfor that is of, of using strange characters and different alphabets. The problem is one of getting sufficient compatibility, which I think would probably be a showstopper. Patrick Moran, London, jolly old England, writes about an article uh, about Triple Des. He says, is nothing safe anymore? Triple Des the triple use of the data encryption standard because des was cracked so you do it three times now it's safe no it's been cracked according to electronics weekly patrick moran a very happy spin right owner i take it you probably looked at this article i looked at the article um okay there is a reason i chose it um because it had the best analogy i've ever heard of a side channel attack and i didn't want to forget to mention it to our listeners because it was just so great um, a little background, DES was the data encryption standard, thus the acronym DES, um, which if memory serves was a 56-bit key. And that's not enough bits anymore. And DES itself had some structural problems. So what was recommended was to do it three times. And... That might sound like, well, how can you take something that's not secure and just do it more and you get security? But that's exactly what our block ciphers do. Remember that AES runs multiple iterations, they call them rounds, multiple rounds using different pieces of, of key material. No one round is at all secure. And in fact, reduced round versions of AES have been cracked because it's you rely on the, the successive rounds in order to get the strength. And when you get enough of them, you just can't penetrate it. So taking, similarly, taking a block cipher like DES and doing it three times, not using the same key three times, but but essentially three different keys. So you take... 56-bit key times 3 would be your new key length. And then you use 50, different 56 bits out of that key for each of the three times. And you end up with something which is still very quick because DES had the benefit of being a, a pretty quick block cipher. Yet, you get really strong security. But, oh, and, and in this case, it's being used in some... some um, electronics-based cards in Europe. And it was one of these cards which was cracked from using a side channel attack. And we talked about that recently. In fact, they used, they noted that power consumption being used by the card when it was in use leaked enough information for them to obtain the key. So, wow. and we, we've talked, we, and we've talked about how Yes, isn't that cool that, that just if you're, if you're sharp enough, and of course we're talking about sharp people, just noting variations in the amount of power the card is consuming while it's processing the crypto, if you understand the way the algorithm interacts with its power consumption, that can be enough in order to give it away. So here's the analogy. Just so, such a perfect analogy of a, of, a tr of a side channel attack on an old school, on old school protection. 
And that is a safe cracker listening to the tumblers drop. Mm -hmm. Because well, when you think about it, I mean, it, it's in, in the same way, and we've, we've talked about this before, Leo, that the hokey way that, com, that long combinations are broken in movies where they stick this cracking device up against something and right. all the digits begin spinning right. and then one by one they lock in. Right. You know, you know, that's exactly the way a safe is cracked because you are, I don't know if anyone is too familiar with the insides of these things, but you have essentially a stack of disks which are, which are notched and the goal is to line up all of the notches and then the disks also interact with each other, pushing each other. And so it takes a, and, and that's where you get this, you know, turn it right five times to sort of get all the disks lined up and then continue to this number, then go back to that number, the other direction to this number, back to that number and so forth. Well, each of those processes leaves a successive disk lined up correctly until when they're all lined up, you're able to, you're able to to um, to have the the bit essentially fall into all of the all of the lined up disks. Well, safe crackers learned that if you stuck a stethoscope on the safe or something else, you could you could audibly hear though that pre-alignment of the disks before they all got aligned and cracked the safe. And so that's a perfect example. You know the the designers of the safe never never wanted you to get any information at all as you were turning the knob back and forth and so it is it is the case that by using this audible side channel attack on a safe that or at least really old school safes that safe crackers could detect when the last disc was aligned and then the second to the last and the third to the last and the fourth to the last and so forth until they got the safe open. They, so they were able to, just like in the movies, uh, you know, get individual digits at a time, the equivalent of that, one at a time using sound as, as the side channel attack on the mechanism, which I just thought was a cool analogy. Question four from Joe Campagna in Ontario, California. He grumbles about Adobe Flash update. Steve, I don't know about you, but in talking with... My non-techie friends, I found they're very frustrated, as I am, when updating Adobe's Flash player. Primarily, is there any logical reason why we are faced with their user agreement every time we update this? Adobe can't actually be changing the terms for every update, can they? I got into a white heat yesterday when faced with this again for the hundredth time. It seems to me there could be an agreement that would be affirmed when it's installed initially and could be reaffirmed occasionally. Maybe we can make this annual. More importantly, when faced with the update flash window, a majority of my friends just click cancel and move on, not knowing that an update is a good thing in terms of safety. I, I believe that if there is any software that should update quietly in the background, this is it. Of course, there should also be the ability to roll back to an earlier version should an update break something. But for the general public, I overwhelmingly suggest that Adobe consider this approach. Sadly, Adobe seems to be following in Microsoft's footsteps in that they don't seem to use the software they're writing. Have they ever tried to walk their mother through an update over the phone? Thanks for everything you do. Signed, Joe in Ontario. So that caught my eye. This was the, the question that I mentioned I was going to get to relative to our listeners who I'm sure are updating Flash probably in something of a sweat or a panic um, when they realize that Adobe has just fixed 12 things which are all being actively exploited to install Dooku or right. the malware du jour on their system. But the idea... And, well, the, the idea that Joe mentioned that he believes he's got friends who are not doing so just because they're annoyed that they're having to do it all the time. Or, and I realize, or they don't get the message. They may say, well, oh, it's working fine for me. I don't have any bugs. I don't need to update. Right. That It's not about Flash not working. Right. It works it's about, fine for me. Well, what do I, I'm not going to update it. And at the same time, there are all these anecdotal reports of everyone apparently on the planet getting 
infested with malware all the time. Well, this may very well be one of the ways it's happening. So I just sort of wanted to, to take a moment for the holidays <laughs> to remind our users to make sure that they're less security savvy friends. Everyone they know who isn't listening to this podcast does take software updating seriously and and you know follows through when flash is saying it needs to be updated don't read the license agreement no one does <laughs> just say okay just say okay yes i would i would not be upset by the license no. agreement no one in the history of man has ever read that once not even the first time you know i so, think we should make a new uh, geek thing when you go home for the holidays you you fix everybody's you update everybody's systems you lock it down just, you know, this is kind of, in fact, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to Thanksgiving tomorrow with my dad's. I'll probably go over to his system, make sure he's updated recently, that all the software is updated. This would be a good thing. Geeks, home for the holiday. We'll have to come up with a catchy phrase for this. Well, and, in fact, it may not even be required that our listeners remember to do so because probably the moment they walk in the door, <laughs> their, their aunt or their <laughs> uncle or, you know, mom or dad is like, TV. oh, uh, John, Stevie, you no, know, printing, printing stopped. It's not it, working, it's Stevie. Yeah, exactly. Well, my, it's true. Uh, uh, every time I go back east to visit mom, we set aside at least a day for, <laughs> uh, she does it, she, for tech support. It's like, yep. okay, remember, one day we're going to get everything working that's not, that stopped working over the last year. Geeks, home for the holidays. We yep, need an acronym. Cleaning. W yeah. Winter cleaning. Yeah. Geek, geek update for the holidays. Something. We'll, we'll come up with something. Question uh, five comes to us from Philip Smith in Lafayette, California, just around the corner. Yeah. A piece. He says uh, he's, he's not happy with iOS security. It's not as safe as you imply. The approval process uh, that's part of the app publishing requirement, I know you understand that, but I think it's time to remind our community just because it's a closed system does not imply innate security. He uh, threats uh, or refers us to a post about this on threatpost.com. Love the show. Cheers, Phil. Uh, let's pull up that post here. But, uh, you know, I think that I've said this many times, that there is the presumption, well, Apple's checking every app on the App Store, so they must all be safe. And, of course, there's no way you can know with 100% certainty, you're not even getting the source that this app is doing everything you think it's doing. Well, and it's more than that, Leo. And this, and this is why I wanted to entertain this question from Philip. It is, it is impossible. It, and I don't mean in the sense of, of Apple couldn't be doing a better job. I mean in the sense of we want an impossible thing. We want our computers to do what we mean, not what we say. <laughs> it, is ab it is absolutely the case. Look at, for example, the clipboard. The clipboard is a, is a massively convenient feature because if even, you know, it was originally maybe designed within an application, you would, you would mark a, a, a clause or a paragraph, for example, and then cut or copy it and then put your cursor somewhere else in the same app and then paste it. So it made it very convenient to move things around within an app. But then it was realized, wait a minute, let's make that a global resource, that is the clipboard, so that we can do inter-app cut, copy, and paste. Whoa, and that's really handy. I mean, who isn't copying URLs out of one place and dropping it somewhere else, putting it in notes, putting it in the browser, and so forth. And now that we've got super complex passwords, we're likely using the clipboard in the same way. The problem is that it's a global resource, and malware has access to the clipboard just as our apps do. So there's a, a perfect example of, of something which is a feature which, because it's a global feature of the system, it becomes useful. That is, it's much more useful to us if we can use it for inter-app movement of data. But if we leave 
sensitive data on the clipboard, and this happens all the time, and it has been widely exploited by malware, then the malware is able to access the clipboard and get whatever we may have happened to leave there. Now, whose fault is that? You the know, clipboard's if, fault. Clip, <laughs> Clippy, Clippy, protect me. I knew Clippy was <laughs> going to come into this. So, so it is, I mean, that, that's just the, I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of other examples, but that's a clean one of where something that is a feature that we all want and use and would be very annoyed if we didn't have is, is, has the potential for abuse. Not because there's anything wrong with it, but because it, it's, it's a feature that can be misused. Right. Now, if we look at iOS, here's a system which is highly locked down. And for example, it, there is deliberately less inter-app flow. They do a lot of sandboxing. There's a lot of sandboxing. And people chafe at the sandboxing that is not easy to move something from one place to another. Right. But that's also protecting us in the same way that, you know, not having a global clipboard protects you. And here's the danger of having a global clipboard we were just talking about. So, so I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever implied that Apple's iOS security is ultimate protection. I certainly know that it's not. And in fact, I think we have a question a little bit later about how Charlie Miller got himself recently blacklisted yeah, for a year yeah. um, from, from because he was wanting to show Apple that they had a problem that they weren't acknowledging. Um, but um, it, I guess my point is that we, we, we want power at no cost. And unfortunately... Even if everything is working right, I think power comes at a, at a price. And iOS being more of a, of a consumer platform, you, you are, you're getting functionality and you're getting more security than if you had more flexibility. But, I, but yeah, I don't think Apple can do a perfect job. They're at, they're, it's impossible for them to know what every app is going to do all the way down. We talked about the sandboxing and how useful it is for the, for you to declare to Apple the things you want your app to do. And we'll be talking about that a little bit shortly. I do. I, and I, I look forward to talking about Charlie Miller because I think that, you know, this is a ridiculous response to a security researcher oh, coming is up with a flaw. Totally wrong response. Yeah, it's like, it's, uh, ooh, we don't like it. <laughs> Well, we'll talk about it in a second. But first, Jason Pritchard in Las Vegas, because he's wanting to know about monitoring the Internet. He says, Steve and Leo, you've, you've talked in the past about organizations like AV companies, research facilities, and such, monitoring Internet traffic seemingly for statistical analysis, maybe to see how a virus moves, knowing the routers send packets to the specified destination and switches only send packets to the port containing the device to which the packet is addressed. That's the difference, I guess, between routers and switches. How would one monitor anything <laughs> except the traffic destined for the monitoring device? I, I know that some broadcast traffic would be detected, but, e but even that should be limited to the network segment on which the device resides. How do research organizations gather information about network traffic? Are they doing it from an Internet backbone? If so, why would the owners of those connections let anyone near them? Thanks for all the great information throughout the years, Jason Pritchard. I thought that was a great question, and we've never in all of our years together <laughs> addressed it directly. Um, okay, so there's two ways. First of all, an organization like Symantec is massive. I mean, they're doing, they've got their security research guys, but there's all this other stuff they're doing and operations and payables and receivables and email and everybody's on the net and they're surfing and Googling and browsing. So a large organization only has to monitor itself in order to have a huge, beautiful cross-section of spam coming in and, you know, and uh, threatening email links and what people are, you know, where people are going and, and what's happening on the internet. So just just an organization looking, you know, the security side of an organization looking at its own, you know, you know, 
um, considering its own navel, if you will, uh, uh, pondering its own navel, uh, gives it enough. I mean, a, a huge cross-section of information. Then the other thing that these organizations do, and it's actually something that, that I have done in the past. I don't monitor it all the time. But, for example, I myself have 64 IP, a block of 64 IP addresses that are completely unused, unallocated. They're, they exist out there in the 4 billion IPv4 space, yet they have never been associated with anything. And that's just a big honeypot. There is traffic on those 64 IPs for no good reason whatsoever. It's not bound for me. It's not bound for anybody. Oh, it's just stuff out there. Huh. It's, it's weird how much traffic there is on this space that never belonged to anybody. It's just things out there. It's, you know, it's like Code Red and NIMDA still existing in a closet somewhere. Out there, every so often, a, a code red or nimda packet comes in. <laughs> Hello, are you there? It's just, <laughs> May I infect you, please? That's just what it sounds like. I'm Leo. lonely. <laughs> no, so, I haven't been able to infect a PC in years. <laughs> <laughs> Still hoping. Are you running Windows ME? Are you? And, and of course, it has been said and it is still true that if you put a, an unpatched Windows machine on a raw internet connection, it won't be long until it is found. Now, I wonder if that's apocry apocryphal these days. I mean, I wonder if that's still the case. We it's should try it. Case. Is it? Really? It, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's those, uh, those worms that self-propagate, and they just, they're internet, they're just endemic on the internet. They just, they're like herpes. They just float around. You never get rid of it. Never get rid of it. Terry Zinger in Dover, Ohio writes... I'm, sure, I'm unsure whether you can help. Here it goes. I recently noticed in my Norton AV 11.X for the Mac some interesting entries. ARP cash poisoning incoming. It listed a MAC address I didn't recognize. Further in investigation indicated the MAC address was for my smartphone. Hmm. I have some tech background with the U.S. Navy, 30 years, another 20 years in tech with the educators. I retired as the tech director for a small school district in Ohio. I'd never heard of ARP poisoning until Norton started to report it. Question, can we stop this attack? After lengthy... <laughs> My phone's attacking me. After lengthy research, I did the following. Change the wireless router at home to reflect the latest security. I realize this is probably closing the barn door after the cows are halfway to Japan, but... Can I change the MAC address on the phone, then block the old MAC address? Is there a clean solution? I assume this attack did not necessarily take place here at home. I use wireless access on the phone whenever possible to help save battery. I hope you can find a little time to help an old veteran and well-used techie. Thanks, Terry A. Zinger. Hmm. Okay, so... Well, we've uh, talked about our poisoning, I know, many times. We have, and my best guess is this is a false positive. Yeah. Which is very possible for the following reason. First of all, uh, a little quick review over on ARP is it's the protocol which is that is ARP formatted protocol packets on Ethernet. It's the protocol which is used to bind an Ethernet MAC address, which is the way the packets actually are addressed on the physical Ethernet wire or Ethernet air to an IP address, which is the way, which is an entirely unrelated addressing scheme, the way packets are addressed out on the Internet, because the Ethernet and the Internet are completely separate things. So... That, for example, Internet IP addresses, as we know, are 32 bits, whereas Ethernet addresses are 48 bits, 24 being the vendor ID and 24 being a unique number within that vendor ID. So there needs to be some way to give an, an, a, an endpoint on the Ethernet that, ha that always will have a, a unique, a globally unique MAC address to give it an IP address. And ARP is the way that's done. 
Um, you can have static IP assignments where the device knows its IP, and so when somebody else on the internet, or I'm sorry, on the Ethernet, I mean the local Ethernet, says, hey, who has this IP address? The device that does will say, I do. And it responds with its MAC address so that the requester is able to then send IP-oriented traffic to the proper hardware. So that's, what, that's the IP to MAC mapping. However, most people um, do not use static IP addressing. They use dynamic IP addressing using the protocol we've also talked about, DHCP, Dynamic Host con Configuration Protocol. In that case, a device which is being asked to connect to the network like your smartphone would when you bring it into the house and... As, as Terry said, he tends to use his Wi-Fi wherever possible, meaning that it, so he's got it set up so that his smartphone will get on his local network. With DHCP, you are asking the DHCP server, which is almost always the, someone's router, which is also has a DHCP server function built in. It is saying, hi there, I'm being asked to use DHCP. I need an IP address. And so the DHCP server looks at its table of available IPs and assigns one which is currently available. And technically, they have a lease time. That is, they, the lease expires, and then it needs to be refreshed. So now we have the case of Norton AV 11 point something running on the Mac. It apparently has a feature where it's going to warn users of ARP cache poisoning. To do that, it would have to be monitoring all the traffic on the network all the time and essentially see the, and, and monitor, build its own table of IP to MAC address associations or mappings. And... What probably happened, what almost certainly happened, is for some reason that table got out of sync. And it's not hard to imagine that it might have. Maybe the machine was turned off and then back on. Or it was briefly unplugged when some ARP traffic changed the network's awareness of these mappings. But this one Mac machine didn't see that. I mean, you know, anything could happen that could cause this to be desynchronized because... There is no good way to, there's no perfect way to prevent, um, to prevent that desynchronization. Essentially, this is not a feature I'm a big fan of for exactly this reason. You don't want to upset people with false positives of something like this when it's so possible that they would occur. So one way or another, the Mac ARP table... The, 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 the Norton AV's ARP table was no longer synchronized with the DHCP table that is residing in the router. Oh. So the smartphone walked in the front door yep. in somebody's pocket, asked for an IP address, and the DHCP server gave it one which Norton AV had as allocated to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what our poisoning would look like, mm -hmm. was if there was a conflict between known and agreed upon IP addresses and MAC addresses. But with DHCP, you're giving out new IPs all the time. So in a statically assigned environment where everything has a fixed IP, you, that w you wouldn't ever expect there to be a false positive, but when, when IPs are floating around, especially with a smartphone coming and going, something else might have received an IP. Maybe the smartphone came back in and tried to use the IP that, because at least it, its lease had not expired, tried to reuse the IP that, that something else had been given in the meantime. I mean, there's all kinds of scenarios where you could see a collision that would generate a false positive. And I'll bet that's what's happened. So, Terry, take a big, deep breath and relax a lot. 
Um, it's, it's, I mean, sure, our poisoning does exist. Maybe your phone got some malware installed. But, you know, given the way the world is, Unlikely. I bet that wasn't the case. I want a new bumper sticker. ARP happens. <laughs> it does. <clears throat> yes, it does. Keegan, <laughs> Keegan Ede in Tempe, Arizona, is a bit confused about Apple's OS sandboxing. I hope his mouth is not as open as yours was. Should it not be? Should not it be the operating system's responsibility to protect itself from viruses or malware? This sort of behavior seems to be what Apple is suggesting is appropriate. That the average user should not need to acquire third-party security packages to keep their computers at baseline. I think we're all in agreement on that. So, why are the developers involved at all? Thanks, Steve. You put on a great show. I'm not security or IT, but uh, you managed to keep the program easily accessible for anyone. Thanks again. Keegan Ede. So I thought maybe I should simplify this whole thing for anyone else who is a little confused by this because it is in detail level. It is can be confusing, mm -hmm. but it's simple. Um, operating systems are responsible for protecting themselves and applications. They yet we've do just a very good job. <laughs> well, the, as, exactly as I was saying in the example of the clipboard, um, the clipboard represents not a defect, but a feature which can be abused. So a perfect example would be if the application did not need the clipboard. If it didn't use the clipboard ever, then it could enhance the security for everyone by declaring that at the at, right off the bat. When it starts up, it says, I do not use the clipboard. Then the OS could remove clipboard access rights from that process. Mm. And the beauty would be then that if that process ever did m misbehave, if it got infected, or it was uh, acting wrongly and tried to use the clipboard or any other feature similar, which it had previously declared it had no use for, the operating system would block it. And that's a good thing. So it makes absolute sense. For I love what Apple's doing, that they have this notion, the no, the no, notion of entitlements. So the idea would be that clipboard access would be an entitlement defined by Microsoft the programmer could say, I either need it, I need that entitlement, or I don't. In which case, the program would not be entitled to access the clipboard. And if all programs that didn't use things they didn't need declared themselves to be non-users, security would be a lot better. So I think it's a great thing. Bruce Harrison. Auckland, New Zealand wonders whether Skype breaks TCP IP. Stephen Leo, whilst, I love it, whilst, whilst listening to your description of TCP IP and how it works, I couldn't help but wonder how Skype and other street, I'm not talking like a Kiwi, unfortunately, and other streaming technologies work. Does TCP IP meticulously ensure that packets are resent and assembled into order whilst Skype disdainfully discards them. This person is a wordsmith. Deeply appreciate your weekly efforts, Bruce. Uh, well, not only is he a wordsmith, he's very smart. Really? Because this is a great question. It's something that we've sort of talked about tangentially, but not, again, never addressed directly. And, and that is... We've looked now at some detail in three separate podcasts building upon the prior ones about how the Internet works. Uh, look, we've looked at TCP, and we recognize that it, see, it sequentially numbers its bytes. It buffers them as, it's be, as they're being sent, as packets of bytes are being sent from the, on behalf of the applications until acknowledgement is received from the other end that that everything that it has that it has sent has been received, in which case it's free to let go of them. But if packets are lost along the way, acknowledgments aren't received, it will retransmit lost packets. It does all this work for us in order to give give us a so-called perfect a a a, a, um, a reliable as opposed to a not reliable connection. 
But Skype is just wanting to send audio. And what happens with packets being dropped or reordered or anything? What does Skype do? Well, the beauty of Skype is it doesn't use TCP because that would be a big problem, exactly as Bruce has surmised. Skype uses UDP. You and I, Leo, are talking over UDP protocol rather than TCP for exactly this reason. Skype excels at, at forgiving us, for, forgiving the Internet for dropping packets. Yet it doesn't worry about a packet dropped a minute ago. We've already moved past that. It sort of fills in, literally, truly, fills in the audio as best it can, interpolating the audio of missed packets. So Skype keeps them small so that packets don't carry too much audio because it recognizes they may get lost. But if so, it doesn't care. So Skype and all other streaming services like this, real-time streaming, streaming services, do not use TCP because they don't want TCP in the way, mucking things up, which is what it would do if it stalled the connection and waited for, like, lost packets to get resent before it could move forward again. Instead, UDP being a non-connection-oriented, non-reliable protocol, they just go off, and if they get there, good. And if not, oh, well, we, you know, that moment passed and we pretty much understand what we're saying to each other anyway. I think so, that's why UDP was created, right? I mean, that's basically the purpose of UDP. I think it was it probably predated any sort of real-time streaming. These geniuses who put this all together just sort of said, well, we probably need one of these and we need one of those. <laughs> and they were right. Sometimes you don't care. Sometimes you yeah. don't want to error correct because that'll just slow you down. Like with DNS, for example, which runs on top of UDP, oh. and you're responsible. I mean, the beauty is there's all that overhead of like SYN, SYNAC, ACK, and all that. There's like all that overhead associated with creating reliability in a packet-based network. Sometimes your, your request is so short. What is the IP for GRC.com? That can go in a tiny packet. Right. And the answer is even smaller. Right. Actually, it's not because it contains the, the answer in DNS contains the query as part of it. But So it gets a little bit bigger. But the point is there you don't want to bother with all that overhead and handshaking and byte numbering and everything. You just want to say, tell me this real quick. And DNS says, here you go. Right. And so these geniuses realize sometimes we don't need reliability. If we don't get the answer, we'll ask again. But most of the time we will, and we don't want, so we don't want all that overhead for something that just doesn't need it. It, 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 it does have a checksum or something so that you know the packet's correct. I mean, it's not, it's not that correct. there's some, no error checking. It's just that there's no resending. Correct. Yeah. Bruce Harrison. Uh, oh, that, that was Bruce. Sorry, Bruce. Now it's Robert Hickman's turn. Uh, he is not our last question, but he's our last real question because right after him, yep. we're going to set up for next week. Robert in Bristol, UK, voices his concerns about single sign-on or one ID solutions. From the sound of it, one ID is going to be yet another closed down proprietary siloed system. And if that's the case, I'm not touching it. Like the Internet as a whole, any kind of widespread authentication system must be open and not tied to any single provider to be trustworthy. We do have a single sign-on system, right? We have uh, open ID. Well, and he's talking about oneid.com, which we which talked we about, talked last, about week. Yeah. last week yeah. from that came out of the privacy conference. And I have to say, much as I hope something succeeds, I kind of have the same feeling. I mean, I, I like the, um, the concept of it, but I like maybe, I hope, fingers crossed, what we're about to talk about next week even more, I which leads us into Tom Jones. Yay. By the way, Web7064 in our chat room says he could tell us a UDP joke, but we might not get it. <laughs> yes. And if you get that, then you got it. Tom Jones in Europe points us to a more promising alternative to OneID.com. Well, thank you, Tom. And it will be, as you say, next week's in-depth show topic. Steve, please take a look at Mozilla's initiative, browserid.org. Mm -hmm. That is, in my humble opinion, a much superior concept to oneid.com, at least in the following five ways. It's not centralized. 
a requirement for wide success on the web. It doesn't depend at all on Mozilla or any single vendor. Privacy. Vendors not informed of visits to third parties. It's not vaporware because you can actually use it right now. And it's free forever. Bonus interest points for Security Now. It basically uses crypto to solve a hard problem in a demonstrably clever way. He uh, passes along a link to webfwd.org. There's a video, a 12-minute video there. Or go to identity.mozilla.com to learn and more about it. Tom from Europe. Steve has created a short bit.ly link to the uh, video, which is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash B dash I-D. For short for browser ID. Um, I, if any of our listeners are curious, this is a cool little MP4 video file, 12 minutes long. The sort of is a little slideshow, gives people sort of a... a a simple, rough overview. It does not in any way preempt the podcasts um, that we'll do next week's in-depth look at how this works. Um, it does a great job, though, of selling its benefits. And if this has been on my radar for some time, I've been intending to get to it. We're going to get to it next week. Uh, we'll all have digested our Thanksgiving dinners uh, those of us who celebrate Thanksgiving and uh, be ready to tackle uh, some nice technology. I'm excited about this for all the reasons that Tom mentions. And I have to agree with him, too, that any s solution to this problem that attempts to be pro proprietary, you know, to be owned by uh, one organization, as any of these things do, uh, suffers from from exactly that i think that, it, that that that's a a um a liability for something that sort of really does need to be open and these the mozilla guys have really done a nice job so next week we're going to do a a propeller head episode looking in detail at some at a very cool sing i mean really cool completely out of your hair sort of solution for for this uh, i can't wait to talk about it good that sounds exciting so we'll do this next week we do it uh, every week usually we do it as we did this week at 11 a.m pacific on thursdays that's uh, 2 p.m eastern time 1900 utc at twit.tv so watch live if you can if you're at work you can tell the boss this is research but you can always listen or watch after the fact. We make audio and video available on our site, twit.tv. Steve does a little extra thing. He makes a 16 kilobit version available at grc.com. That's for the bandwidth impaired. He also has full transcripts, which are nice. Again, as we mentioned earlier, because of Thanksgiving, Elaine's going to get a day, a day to eat turkey. So we'll probably get the transcript up on Friday, I guess, Steve, right or Saturday. Yeah. But you'll find that at grc.com, along with all the other great stuff Steve does, including his bread and butter, Spinrite, the world's best finest must have hard drive maintenance and recovery utility grc gibson research corporation.com you can also follow steve on the the twitter he doesn't follow you he won't he's following zero people yeah <laughs> he don't want to hear from you no you can actually if you at steve on twitter he'll he sees his at replies so it's at s g g r c yeah so you mentioned me as it's called right and then i and i see them and uh, I would, again, encourage people to check my Twitter feed, even if you're not following me or not a Twitter user. You can just go to twitter.com slash SGGRC because during the week I do tweet useful and interesting things um, often. And uh, so you can sort of stay current that way as well. That's a good thing to do. I like that. And yeah. let's remind everybody about the put their thinking caps on about snippets and segments from past Security Now podcasts that they think would bear repeating for yes, yes. whatever reason. Uh, Twit.tv slash best of to contribute those because we, we want to do a best of so that Steve and I do not have to work the, the week uh, after Christmas. We want to take one week off a year. That's it. Just one. Uh, That's all, all we, we ask. ask. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Steve, thank you so much. Great job. As always, I look forward to next week. I'll see you right here on Security Now. Security now.